But welcome everybody to our May Ladies uh, Hunting and Angling Social Hour. Uh, my name is Jennifer Morgan. Um, uh, most of you guys know all the rest of our staff that's here this evening, um, Stephanie, Tristana, and Colleen. Um, we're kind of keeping things very uh, truncated, I should say, just so we can give Christine a full amount of time because we've got lots of uh, awesome information to cover. The only person I am going to pick on real quick is Melissa. Um, is she, she, I don't know if she's here yet. Now, Melissa Garrett is not here yet. She is yeah, our yeah. new, oh, she's where here. are you? She's down, she's down, well, um, she's down there on my end. Okay, uh, if, if you can uh, show your, your face, if not, um, Melissa is our new public information specialist in Roswell. Um, oh, there you are, yep, I see you now. <laughs> um, uh, Melissa, just real quick, give us a little intro to yourself, to the group. Oh, you're on mute. Hey, can you guys hear me? Okay, now we're good. Yeah, hi everybody. Uh, my name's Melissa Garnett and I'm the new um, public information specialist in the Southeast. Um, coming here from Florida Fish and Wildlife, I'm really excited about this topic. I was a, uh, a biologist, fisheries biologist in a bass hatchery for a long, long time. <laughs> so um, I'm excited to be here today. Thanks, Melissa. All right, I'm going to turn it over to Stephanie and then Christine, and uh, we're going to kick it off. All right, thanks so much for joining us. I hope y'all are just as excited, if not more, than I am for tonight's Lady Social Hour. Um, very special guests that we've had on the Social Hour, and we continue to add to that list with Christine Fisher, uh, native Nebraskan. Um, she used to own her own Pilates studio and went from Pilates, Pilates studio owner to uh, pro kayak angler and super excited. Thank you so much, Christine, for joining us here tonight. Um, we're, we just want to soak up all your knowledge and, and get, get to know kayak angling a little bit more. So tell us about yourself. Well, first off, thank you all so much for having me. Uh, it's it's an absolute honor, and I was really excited to be able to find the time in my schedule to make this happen. So thank you all the ladies watching and all of you all that put this on. Um, I feel super honored to be here. So uh, yes, um, my background, y'all, I, like, like you said, I'm from Nebraska. Um, I grew up in a really small town there. Uh, I didn't have a television at all growing up. And to this day, I've never had a TV in any of the homes that I've ever owned. So that's one unique thing about me. And because of that, I really think that it helped kind of foster my love for the outdoors. Um, my brother and I, that's kind of all we knew. We grew up doing a lot of fishing, fish family walleye tournaments. So my background actually, I, I do all bass now for the most part, but my background is musky, pike, perch, walleye. That's kind of what I did as a kid growing up and how I cut my teeth fishing. Um, so I, out of college, like a lot of people, I had no idea what I wanted to do. Um, I was very bored in high school and very bored in college. I did play college volleyball. Um, and out of that, I got a job before I started teaching Pilates working at, um, I don't know if y'all are familiar with Shields. Shields, it's a, it's an outdoor retailer. Um, they are branching out a little bit, but it's primarily in the Midwest. And I was at the time, the only female, what they consider up in the hard line section. So I sold hunting, fishing and worked at the bow shop. So I did, I tuned customers bows that were into archery and sold all of the outdoor hunting and fishing equipment. So, and I felt right at home there. I was, I, again, I was the only female. So that is kind of where I got my, uh, the intro to being in a very male dominated area was selling in hard goods for five years. And I found out very quickly that I wasn't very cut out for corporate life. And um, one of the gun guys, actually, I was sitting there talking to him and I was saying, man, I just don't know if I can keep doing this. I love what I'm doing, but I, you know, punching the time clock and I'm just not, I'm not wired like that. My whole family's entrepreneurs. And he's like, well, if you want more free time, you know, my, my wife does really well teaching Pilates. And at the time I was like, what is that like a, is that like a fancy style of yoga? I had no idea what Pilates was. So lo and behold, my spontaneous self, I paid about $10,000 and committed a year to flying to golden Colorado once a month for that, the 12 months to get certified in this thing called Pilates. 
And I ended up absolutely falling in love with it. Um, and I was not a fitness person at all. I just, in my mind, selfishly, I was like, oh, okay, this is great. I can teach this, you know, and I'll have all this time. I make my own schedule and I can go and hunt and fish and travel the world as much as I want to when I want to. And I ended up absolutely falling in love with what I did there and helping a lot of people become pain-free and learning a lot about anatomy and how the body is supposed to move. So it ended up being really, really cool, but that wasn't where I was meant to be. It was a stepping stone to get to where I am now. And because it allowed me to have a very free schedule, I started um, fishing more and much more in a kayak because it was accessible for me. Uh, I grew up fishing in boats, but at the time I didn't have the money for a boat and I uh, didn't trust myself running a boat wide open because I was kind of a wild child back in the day. So it's like, oh, this kayak fishing thing looks pretty safe. It, I can take it. I can throw it on the top of my SUV. I can go anywhere with it. And I started fishing kayak tournaments on the local level and um, ended up actually doing really, really well in my first local tournament I fished. I didn't know anybody. There was, I think, 45 or 50 guys there at Lake Wanahoo, Nebraska. And I ended up coming in third and I was hooked from there. Uh, I started qualifying for some bigger tournaments nationally and would go on to compete at the Tournament of Champions in Lake Fork, where I absolutely blanked and got humbled very quickly. I mean, I, I, I thought that I was going to come down there and just take my Nebraska skills and put it up against all these guys from all the country. And I got humbled so fast. And I remember I was in tears and I was like, man, this fishing thing's not for me. I can't compete. And uh, on the whole drive back to Nebraska, I, I had a fire lit in me and I said, no, like I, I really have this huge desire to learn, to soak up all the knowledge I can and get better. And the rest is history. Um, I started traveling all over the country and in my free time while teaching Pilates to fish and started documenting kind of my travels and my tournaments and ended up having, after a couple of years, having a lot of success on the national trail, um, so much to where I was able to leave the Pilates world behind. And uh, the last six years, I've been on the road full time, literally living on the road, um, traveling all over the country. I lived in a travel trailer for two and a half years. And um, the last couple of years, I've been trying to build a house in Tennessee with that's almost done. I've got a month left. I saw somebody in the comments is from Tennessee. I'm so excited to have a home base there. And uh, the rest is history, y'all. So I've been doing this for a long time. Um, I was the first female to ever win a to, to even come in the top three of a big tournament. I went in to win a tournament the following year. I won our most coveted championship ever. Um, only 50 people qualify for it. And I won that, which was my biggest prior career accomplishment. I qualified for Hobie Worlds over in Sweden and I've qualified for the next several worlds. I was the only female in the world to qualify for that tournament. So it was uh, really, really cool for me. And I think it's really, I hope it's helped a lot of other women see that they can do this too, and they can compete with the guys and, and show out. And it's just a matter of if your passion's there and if you have got the heart, because what I don't have in talent, I sure try to make up in heart. And I think that's a huge, huge, huge thing in this sport. So that being said, that's just kind of my background in a nutshell and kind of where I'm at and how I got to where I'm at now. And um, from what I've learned, y'all are wanting to kind of learn a little bit about warm water fishing and, and you've got some muddy water lakes down there, which I absolutely love fishing muddy water. I'll touch briefly on that. But what I really want is after I kind of touch on a few things, I want to be an open book on anything and everything, kayak fishing, um, sponsorships, fishing, muddy water, rods, reels, baits, any lake in the country. I mean, I, I have fishing licenses in 35 states. So y'all just please ask I'm, anything you want. And I will talk as much as you guys want to listen to me talk about it. Um, so muddy water, my favorite baits for fishing muddy water. And this is uh that that's, if any of you all watch my YouTube videos, I always talk about when you go to a lake, you want to fish your strengths. You want to fish where, how you're comfortable fishing. And for me, that's shallow, muddy water. I love it. I look for on bodies of water that have clear water, that have muddy water. A lot of times way up north in the river sections of the areas I fish have a lot of stained water. And that's where you're going to find me fishing on tournament day uh, because that's what I, I feel very comfortable in. So some of my very favorite baits, I want to 
probably give you the number one bait that I love throwing. And it doesn't really matter what time of year, but I'll tell you a little bit about it. And then a couple of little secret modifications that I do to this bait. I'm going to snag it right here. And that is, if I can get it off my rod. I just was using this today. So it's, it's a little beat up, but it'll serve, serve the purpose here. Got here my scissors. And that is a spinner bait. So these baits, though they look really, really simple, but the, the truth of the matter is they come in all different sizes, all the way down from a quarter ounce, all the way up to an ounce and a half or even two ounces. And the biggest thing are the blade configurations here. Um, a lot of spinner baits are going to come with a super long skirt and they have no trailer on them. And the, the trailer is just any type of soft plastic that you're going to add to the hook here to give the bait a little bit more of a profile. So the first thing right off the bat that I like to do, if I'm fishing really muddy water, especially in the spring, um, this is probably true to where y'all that are there in New Mexico, y'all have crayfish out there, I'm assuming. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So around 50 degrees, a, a lot of crayfish are going to come out and become more active. That's when they're kind of looking for a mate. And at least out on the South, like that's a huge phenomenon in bass fishing. So a lot of times you're going to see people take this blade right here, which is this little Indiana or even a Colorado blade, and they're going to have a red or an orange one. And for whatever reason, just having that red or orange color on just this little blade right here in the spring is the difference between getting like 20 bites versus five. And I've tested this a bunch of times. So in the spring, having just a little red kicker blade, and it usually always needs to be this, this is called a Colorado. There's an Indiana. This is a big willow right here. And the blade combination is big. If you're fishing clear water, having two willow blades is, is a really big deal. Those blades are long, they're slender. These are fluted blades. They're going to create way less movement in the water. But when you're fishing muddy water, you'll see these spinner baits. Some of them just have a big single Colorado blade. Some of a big single Indiana blade. A larger, more circular blade is going to move a lot more water. So I love to kind of play with those blade configurations in that really colorful water. Um, and the first thing I'm going to do a lot of times, the spinner baits come with very long, big, bulky skirts. I've already trimmed this one up. Can you guys see how like there's some shorter, shorter strands here? I like to make, I like to take a pair of scissors and come in and just trim up the majority. And sometimes I'll even trim up more than this of the skirt. So it's just right around the hook and it's not as, as heavy, especially when you're fishing clear water. A lot of people don't realize that. Um, the skirt can almost give the bait a really unnatural look. So I'll almost cut the skirt that comes with every spinner bait. I'll either turn it upside down or hang it there. And I'll come in and just kind of go around the whole body of that spinner bait. And I'll take a lot of the skirt away. And that makes a huge, huge, huge difference. That and then adding just a very, very subtle trailer on the end of it. A lot of times I'll put like a zoom split tail, which is just literally a, like a three and a half, four inch plastic. That's very long and slender and just a little bit of plastic, putting that on a spinner bait gives that bait a much more real natural look. And I'm telling you like those very small changes are a huge difference in getting more bites for sure. So it is, when it comes to muddy water, um, when I host a women's event every year and we've got women for all the country that come and they're, they really want to know, like, how do I get more bites? I'm struggling in a tournament. I just want to try to get a limit. I just want to catch fish. A spinner bait is such an easy bait to fish and cover a lot of water, especially if you're fishing up shallow. It's one of the best search baits out there. All you have to do is cast and retrieve it. Whereas a lot of these other baits, like a swim jig, you'll hear people talking about like an Alabama shake and it, it takes kind of a, a specific technique to really get a lot of swim jigs working the right way. A spinner bait is so simple and cast it and retrieve it. Now you can bury your retrieve. You can fish it a little faster. You can fish it a little slower, depending on what weight you have but it's a great, easy bait to fish that you can cover a ton of water and it really, really shines in those shallow, muddy water situations, especially with the Colorado or Indiana blades. So it's one of my all-time favorites. Um, does anybody have any questions on anything spinner baits? Has it been anything come up yet? Yeah, can so yeah, someone just tells me, cause I don't know if I can see 
um, all of the uh, all of the chat there. Yeah, we'll we'll mediate the chat for you, and then also if anybody uh, has questions, you can use the raise hand function, and that'll put pin you up in our our view screen, so we can get to you right away. But that's cool. That's very cool. Um, okay, so the next thing I really like, and this is um, by the way, spinner baits, chatter baits, um, or bladed jigs, uh, crank baits. You're, those are all called moving baits, like power fishing. And you hear people refer to power fishing. That's kind of a, the move, they're in the moving baits category. They're the casting and retrieving. So sometimes the fish really want that. And I love it when they do, because it's, it's fun and it's, they're aggressive, but a lot of times they don't. And so if you're not getting bit on those moving baits, um, one of my next favorites is just a, especially in dirty water. And this was a big thing in, for me in Nebraska is a large, uh, black and blue jig. If you if y'all ever heard of the jig and pig, it's a like a pig chunk trailer with a big black jig, and that's where I do like to have. I, I like to have a big kind of profile, large skirt. I don't mess the skirt too much. The big brushy weed guard on there, and just working that, hopping it really slow along the bank in super muddy water. It's really important to have black and blue or straight black, as dark of a profile as you can, so this fish can find that bait. But if they're not really reacting to the moving baits, your spinner baits, your chatter baits, um, you're going to want to try like a big profile jig because in muddy water, you still need to have something that those fish can key in on and see. And I, I love, there's a lot of different companies that make them out there, but I love just a really even light quarter ounce or three eighths ounce large profile flipping or skipping jig is huge for those situations. Um, Hey, Christine. Yes. We, we do have a bunch of questions already. I think um, they had a chance to kind of uh, absorb. So I've got a few questions yes. if, if you, okay, are you ready? Let's go. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, so Chris was asking, does weight matter on spinner baits or a preference? Yes, absolutely. So when I look at the weight of a spinner bait, and again, they come in all different weights. I think the lightest they really make is a quarter ounce is what I would consider a fairly light spinner bait up to a three eighths, half ounce, um, three quarter ounce, an ounce is probably the, the variations that I use. And the probably the most common weights that I'm going to use are going to be three eighths and half ounce. Now the weight you're going to want to look at how deep you're fishing. Um, if you're fishing, say like anywhere, anywhere less than five foot of water is where I'm going to do probably like a three eighths ounce or a, even a quarter ounce. And a quarter ounce is usually a lot smaller. They've got a smaller hook. They're lighter weight in general. So if you want, um, if you want something that you're fishing very, very pressured fish and you want a smaller, lighter profile or something super, super shallow, I love fishing that quarter ounce. Um, I've got a lot of super skinny rivers. And I mean like a foot deep that are loaded with small mouth. And I love a little lightweight quarter ounce spinner bait. If you're fishing, I'll use a three quarter ounce and a, like a, like an ounce. If I'm fishing deep, if I'm slow rolling a spinner bait and deeper than like 10 foot of water, um, or if there's heavy current. So if I'm fishing a river with really heavy current and, and that I'm having a really hard time getting a lighter spinner bait to stay down where I want it to, that's when I'll add more weight to kind of get that bait through the current. The problem with the, the, the heavier spinner bait is it is a larger profile. It's a bigger spinner bait. And so sometimes those fish don't necessarily want to commit to a, a larger bait like that, but it depends on the depth of water you're fishing. So for me, about eight times out of 10, it's going to be a three eighths or a half ounce every single time. Those are the two most popular, popular ones for me. Is there a particular spinner bait brand that you like? And do you add any scent? To yes. The bait? Um, so as far as the brands go, there's a couple. Um, I'm, I'm with, I'm sponsored by Abu Garcia and I, they just came out with spinner baits. I think those are pretty good, but off the record also, I've always been a huge fan of accent and the difference between the accent and it's A C C E N T. Um, I've been ordering those for a long time before, uh, Berkeley came out with their spinner baits and Berkeley does have their, uh, scented skirts on there. So that's one thing I really, really like about those and where I like fishing the Berkeley ones. And this is something kind of technical. That is kind of a cool tip here. Um, in addition to the blade configurations, spinner baits also have what they call like their diameter of the wire, which is this right here, the arm of the spinner bait. 
So this actually is an accent right here. And it's really hard to tell, but the, the accent makes a super light finesse wire spinner bait. And that's why I love them because when you have a super light wire, that whole bait is going to shimmy differently than something with a, a heavier wire. So where I like fishing, like the Berkeley spinner baits with the, the max scent, um, or the power bait skirts, because those are awesome. They are scented. And that's, that'll address that question is if you're fishing around heavy, heavy cover, or the fish aren't necessarily put off by, um, a heavier wire spinner bait. The good thing about those spinner baits, they're not going to tear up. You can fish them through heavy cover. You can fish them and they're going to last you 15, 20 fish, a light wire spinner bait where it's great is again, super clear water, really pressured fish or where they're, they're not quite committing. And this bait will sometimes get bit, but you catch, you hook one or two small mop on this. It's done. Like that's it. And they're expensive. So that's the only thing that's kind of tough. So if I'm say I'm practicing for a tournament, I'm not throwing this because I don't want to tear any of these up. I'll save it for the tournament day. So I love the Berkeley ones. They, they are brand new. They came out a couple of months ago. They come in a ton of different colors. Color is another thing. Like I said, I always love having, um, they call them like the spring dinger in the spring, but any white chartreuse, um, it also get the brim colored spinner baits, bluegill colored spinner baits. Those are phenomenal because a lot of times bass really key on brim in certain times of the year, especially post spawn. So I love getting a lot of your white chartreuse variations. And then the brim is going to be like a green pumpkin with a little bit of blue or purple in the skirt. Um, that, and sometimes I'll throw like a, sometimes I'll throw a darker colored spinner bait but for the most part. I really just keep it pretty, pretty simple with colors. And then a couple other little minor things that people are asking is, uh, thoughts on chatter jigs and, um, weight of the trailer. Do, uh, take, do you take into consideration the weight of the trailer? So two different questions there. Yeah, absolutely. So um, as, as far as the trailers, they really don't come in weights, but they're going to, and, and trailers, think about it like, let's see where I grab just a couple of them here. Um, <laughs> trailers are going to come in different sizes. So a trailer is just simply like a soft plastic. Um, so like a, like a paddle tail, that's a trailer. You can fish as a standalone bait or you can just feed it up the hook and it can act as a trailer on a spinner bait. This can be a trailer on a swim jig. It can be a trailer on a, on a chatter, on a chatter bait or a bladed jig as well. Um, so you've got like a creature bait, like a, any kind of crawfish imitation. You've got your fluke style baits that are tapered tail and you've got your paddle tail baits. All of those are trailers and they all come into play at different times of the year or depending on how you want to fish. So earlier on in the year, and this, this is, this is going to apply to all moving baits, to your spinner bait, to your chatter bait, um, and to your swim jig. So earlier on in the year, like, let's say when the water temp is below 58 degrees. So your, your pre-spawn when the water's still pretty, pretty cold and those fish aren't super active, you don't want a trailer that's going to move a lot of water or have a ton of action. Um, so those creature baits or the, the crawfish trailers that have two legs that move a lot like this, you want to completely avoid that, um, in the early part of the year, because that's, that's not traditionally what the fish are wanting to key on. You want to keep the bait very, very simple and have very little action. Now, as the water warms up and those fish are becoming more aggressive and they're chasing a little bit more, that's when I like to throw like a paddle tail is a, is a trailer that's going to move a lot of water and have a lot more action on it. Or like a, a creature bait, um, like I said, a craws that move a ton. So that's when, that's what it comes in handy for trailers. They don't really come in weights. They come in sizes. There's, you know, two inches, two and a half, three inches, three and a half, four inches, which is getting pretty big. This is a, a actually a 4.8 inch. It's a pretty big trailer. Um, yes. Yeah, so what was the, uh, what was the other one? I don't know if I covered that. Oh, chatter baits. Yes. Love chatter baits. Um, love them. One of my favorite places to throw chatter baits is around grass. So I love throwing spinner baits and open water. You can fish them around grass just fine. So they don't come through them as well. But if I'm fishing a lake, that's got a bunch of lay downs, like a bunch of wood on the bank. Spinner baits are awesome around wood. I love fishing chatter baits in the grass because chatter baits come through the grass 
really, really well. They come through the grass very clean. One of my favorite ways to fish a chatterbait, um, there's actually a lot of different ways to fish it. And this is how I can tell if somebody is a chatterbait gear or not, is a lot of people just cast and retrieve it, right? Well, those fish see that all the time. So there's several different ways to fish a chatterbait. And actually today, um, when I was filming with the, my videographer here, I caught a seven pounder this morning. I actually just posted that on my Instagram. It's huge fish on a chatterbait. And I was, I was fishing it straight retrieve a little bit. I was burning it and killing it, burning it and killing it, nothing, nothing. Well, then I got on this big grass flat and I was literally, I'd cast it out and let it fall. And I let it get down on the grass and I'd rip, rip, rip and let it fall. And I'd rip, rip and then all of a sudden I ripped once and it, my rod loaded up and it was there. And I fished that, I'd fished that whole flat before just doing different things like burying my cadence and didn't get a bite. And then I started catching them just ripping that chatterbait out of the grass. So that reaction, and you can't do that with a spinnerbait, but a chatterbait is so versatile and it allows you to fish it literally any way you want. And uh, it was really cool. That's a fun bite. So yes, awesome, awesome bait. And one last question, um, can you use, I think they're referring to your um, spinnerbait for musky fishing. Oh my gosh. Yes, absolutely. Um, the only thing is muskie is going to tear that thing up and your chances of landing them, especially if you're throwing it on fluorocarbon, all right, it's going to be a little, little, little sketchy, but I actually, you know, muskie fishing is my passion. That's what, if I'm not bass fishing in a tournament, I'm traveling somewhere to muskie fish. That is, I, I love muskie fishing. I've done it since I was a kid. Um, and I actually have several musky grade spinner baits, like the big ounce and a half, two ounce super heavy wire i'm talking much more durable than a bass spinner bait spinner baits were musky they love them do you have an example of can you show us an example of a chatter bait do you yeah. have one available a couple of people are asking about that yes um i do and then while you're looking um somebody's asking if you uh, surface water for frogs and um do you yeah. use trailers on on frogs got you okay so this i so this is like my <laughs> That's my grab and go box. <laughs> it is an absolute mess, but I have about a hundred of these that have one will be all chatter baits, one will be all jigs, one will be all top water. Well, I can't take all those on the water with me. So I just take one box and I grab from all these boxes and throw it in here. So I've got like everything that I frequently fish in here. Um, so that's that black and blue jig. This is remember that creature bait trailer with a lot of action I was talking about that you want to throw like later in the year? That's that. See how that makes a ton of movement? Like that, that's a that's one of those baits. And then a, a bait that I would fish early in the year that doesn't have a ton of movement. This is the trailer that I use. See, it's a very straight, tapered tail. So that doesn't move as much water or have as much action near like this does. Right. So this is a bladed jig. I've got a bunch of different colors. I'm gonna grab a couple of them out here. This is that spinnerbait trailer I was talking about. See how subtle that is? It's just a, it's a zoom split tail. That's one of my, and I actually have that on a chatterbait right now because the fish were just really, uh, really picky in particular where I was down in Georgia last week. So these are all bladed jigs. So what a bladed jig is, and I've got, I actually have, I've got like four different trailers on these right now. Um, a bladed jig is essentially, it's got, uh, I can't see where my, it's got a jig head. And then you've got just a skirt, which I've already trimmed this one up. Um, this is a four-aught hook. And then it has what makes it a blade jig is this hexagon blade right here. And so when you, here's my line tie, when it's coming through the water, this blade is going to hit the head of that jig and it creates a lot of noise and a lot of vibration. And uh, the fish really, really like it. This bait has won so many tournaments in professional bass fishing over the last 12 or 13 years, I think it was first introduced back in the early 2000s um, in the Carolinas. Awesome, thanks. I think that got, got us all caught up there. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, there's a bend in the wire, makes a V-shape, you tie it right at the point in the V. Yes, so okay. right. And um, that's another thing. So um, I you know I said earlier, those super light wire, like the accent spinner baits, I love them because they move a lot. If if you notice, like you tie the line right here, by the way, right there, a little trick. Um, but if you notice that, say you catch a fish and it, your spinner bait is not moving right, a lot of times, I'm going to kind of bend this one. See how it's kind of that wire is bent out a little now. 
you can just look at that and you can sometimes manipulate your bait and get as much life out of that spinner bait as you possibly can just by making sure. And that's one thing you always want to look at if the bait and as, as you fish these more, you'll get to understand when a bait feels right. And when it doesn't, when it's moving, right, when it's vibrating, right. And same with buzz baits, if buzz baits don't sound right. There's something wrong. And a lot of times you just physically hang the bait there and look at it. And if that wire does not come straight down to the center of that head, I mean, I'm telling you the fish that they won't eat it. It's gotta, I mean, things some, a lot of times have to be so perfect, especially on super heavy pressure flakes. Yeah, the other question was uh, like the surface water for the frogs. Yes. Is fishing with frogs and then do you ever put a trailer behind, behind that? So um, I think I wanna make sure I'm understanding that question right. Let me grab a couple of frogs here. Because when it comes to frog, frog fishing is one of my favorite things ever. And there are several different types of frogs, um, several different types of frogs. So there is like a, what I would call a, um, you could use as a trailer on a buzz bait, but this is like a, a ribbit style frog or like a swimming frog. And that comes by itself. You put a, just a belly weighted hook in that and then you just you're swimming it on top of sparse pads then you've got your traditional hollow bellied frog right we've all seen one of these before that has just a very tapered nose then you're going to have a frog just like this that has kind of a scoop in the nose like a like an open like a pop we call that a popping frog um so these you you don't want to put necessarily any plastic or any additional piece on any open water frog sometimes what people will do if they're they're missing a lot of hook, like hook sets or their their hookup ratio is not very good on a frog, they will sometimes come in and put a trailer hook, which is just a uh, it's a hook that's made specifically for frog fishing. It's got a black uh, ring around the base of it, and you're just going to slide that on the base of the hook, and it sticks out just like this right here. I don't really like putting trailer hooks on frogs because it makes them way less weedless. And I think that if you want to improve your hookup ratio on frog fishing, there's a couple things you can do. Right out the gate, uh, a lot of frogs need several modifications to them. A lot of people will just get a frog straight out of the package and they're going to start fishing it. And what I like to do is I like to remove the hook of the frog, especially if this one right here, I've already done this too. So it's going to be tough to tell, but like a brand new frog, the body cavity is like really, really rigid. So it's tough to collapse down. And what gets you a good hookup ratio is if the bass, when it eats the frog, this plastic comes all the way down and they're able to get those two hooks right there exposed. Well, if the frog is really rigid and has a super hard body, they're not gonna be able to get those hooks penetrated very well in the top of their mouth. So I'll take the plastic out and I'll either put it in boiling water for a few seconds that a lot of times will soften the plastic up, maybe like 10, 15 seconds, and then try it and see if it, if it um, gets a little better. And the next thing I'm gonna do, I do this in a lot of baits um, and I've already done it to this one, but I'll come in and I'll, again, the legs in a frog usually are about that long. And that, when you have legs that are about that long and it's, Swim, it's moving on top of the water like this. If the bass sees that huge profile, there's a good chance they're going to come up and just grab the back and completely miss the hooks. So I always trim up the legs on my frog to make it look more natural. And another thing, once you get really confident frog fishing and you learn how to, what they call walk the dog, and that's making the frog do this in the water, which is honestly, if you can do that, that's going to get you so many more bites than just pop, 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 pop. Walking a frog is, is the way to fish a frog. I mean, it really is. Um, but when you have very long legs and you have all that resistance in the water, it's going to make it almost impossible. I can't walk a frog with legs dragging in the water like that. So I'll come in and, and a frog, I don't just trim across straight like that because that'll completely just destroy the profile of the legs. I will come in and I'll like come up here and take a couple strands and cut and I'll come on the backside and cut some down here. So I'm just kind of like almost thinning out the legs like that instead of just cutting straight across like that. Cause I still want to keep the profile. I just don't want as much weight dragging in the water. So that's going to help you um, get a lot more bites than that as well. But yeah, you don't want to put anything else on a frog except for maybe if you're really struggling with getting a good hookup ratio, putting a trailer hook on the back of it. Um, but like I said, there are, goodness, there's about 
three or four main different styles of frogs. They all come into play depending on what you're fishing. They come in different colors. Um, I love fishing a popping frog, which is the frog with the scoop mouth on it and open water, because when you walk it, it moves a ton of water. And keep in mind, you guys, um, frog fishing, a lot of people think that they're trying to mimic frogs about, I would be willing to bet that about 70%, 75% of the time bass eat a frog, they think it's bait fish, shad, brim, uh, sunfish, whatever main bait fish is in your lakes. That's what bass are really keyed in on a lot of the times. Um, and people are even fishing around grass. They think it's bait fish. So you want to really try to make the frog look like a bait fish. And that's why walking it just on top of the water like that, when you see shad flicking around, that's exactly what that looks like. And bass more times than not, this is not meant to be a frog. Um, which is kind of cool. So the colors I like, I always, I mean, frogs, you see them in a thousand colors. That's totally not necessary. You need three colors. You need white, you need black, and you need like a brim color, like a really natural, like iridescent, you know, finesse style color, I think. Dirty water, white or black every time. That's all you need. Awesome. We are all caught up on the questions. Um, so yeah, take it away on whatever direction. Or unless Stephanie, you've got some stuff. No, this is all fantastic. And I think especially the lures and what you would use. And, um, you know, I think maybe a lot of our, our audience, um, I'm thinking about reels and rods here and maybe like those little push button reels, you know, can you be successful? And when you're using those push button reels and, and what would you suggest that people either start off with or even going to the next level as far as rods and reels go? Oh, absolutely. Like the, like the Zebcos, shoot, that's what everyone, I mean, that's what I started out with when I was a kid. Like, I, I love that thing. And honestly, to this day, that's what my grandpa fishes with and that's his heart. Oh my gosh. Yes. Um, again, he's a walleye guy, not a bass guy, but I'll take him to the farm pond back home and he'll have this Zebco 33 with line. That's probably older than me on it and fishing a frog. And I, I think to this day, he's never got one in successfully, but we have a really good time doing it. So that's really all that matters at the end of the day. Um, what I suggest everybody, uh, there's obviously in, in conventional fishing, there's your two main styles. You've got a, you, well, three, there's the spin cast, which is the push button. There is a spinning rod, um, which is what most people are very comfortable with using. And then there's a bait caster, which a lot of people have a lot of trepidation with because they feel like they're going to backlash. And it does take a little bit more practice to use those. But I think that when you're starting off bass fishing or even, you know, walleye, panfish, anything, you know, multi-species, a spinning rod is a great, great, great tool. Now you can't do everything on a spinning rod because what a spinning rod doesn't quite have the power that a casting rod will, but you can do a lot of things and you can catch a lot of fish, especially, I mean, you can throw light spinner baits. Um, you can throw, I've got a friend down in Florida, Brie, that throws a chatter bait on a spinning rod. And though it's probably not ideal, you can catch fish on it. So um, I like like a seven foot medium spinning rod is just a super versatile do it all. And if you can't throw a bait caster, I would love to suggest everybody um, find someone that's good at the bait caster. If you've got somebody in your area and just learn, that's one of the most popular classes at my women's event is learning how to use a bait caster. So we teach, um, that's one of the things that we teach on and help people cast. And the biggest thing with bait casters is learning how to tune your reel because on a spinning reel, you don't have to worry about mechanical brakes or spool tensioner. And on a bait caster, you've got a spool tensioner and you've got brakes. And if you don't know what any of those things do, you're going to go out there and cast and it's going to backlash every time. But once you learn how to kind of dial those things in, it's, it makes it so much easier and you become much more comfortable. And a lot of people, you know, that's all they want to fish with is bait caster then. That's awesome. Um, and as far as the lures go, you know, you were kind of showing some big ones and I don't know, ladies, maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the smaller ones might be more popular around here. I'm not sure if that's like a thing or not, but that's always what I'm thinking of when I go out. Maybe it's because it's trout that I'm fishing for, but um, are there any other smaller ones that you would use? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, or I actually I used to do a 
I used to do a lot of trout fishing too. So I, a lot of fly fishing. That's what I did when I traveled because I couldn't bring any rods with me. So I'd bring a nine weight and a five weight and a backpack when I'd go to like the Bahamas or to Canada or down to a marble Canyon. And I would just fly fish. I'm terrible at it, but I love it. So, um, yes, yeah, smaller. Boats. Yeah. I've got a b- bunch of those. So uh, one of the gals I know was talking about Lake Powell and that I've got a couple of small baits that again, if you're struggling to get bit these, I always break these out if I need help, um, in a tournament. So I'm going to get a couple of these and I'll pull them out here really quick. There was another lady, uh, Crystal was asking about the flaming gorge in Utah as well. If you've ever fished that. I hadn't ever fished the flaming gorge. No. Um, I had fish, I said, fish Lake Powell which was an awesome fishery and this actually this bait right here i'm gonna show you all is uh I, I love this combo um so these are little they're tungsten kitech round ball jig heads what they're called i'm super I don't, I don't know my i feel like i my camera's here and i put it there and i can't see it on my screen so i'm gonna try to like figure out where it's at here we go there you, it's perfect. There you go right there yep so i love this thing you can put so many different baits on it. And the next thing, so this is on Lake Powell and those like deeper flaming gorge too, this would absolutely crush them. This is a a hula grub. You'll see that. So you can either, I'll do two things, this little round ball jig head. Um, I'll take a little swim bait and this is on an underspin. That's another great, like finesse small bait fishing on a spinning rod. It's basically just a jig head with a, a little blade on it. It's called a fish head underspin. And this is just a, you can put like a, like a 3.3, 2.8, 3.3 little, this is a Kitech right here, but um, all different companies make them little swim bait right here. So what I'll do, and this is one of my favorite smallmouth baits. I've caught, I've caught big trout on this on accident. Um, caught a lot of big bass on it. I'll put a little swim bait on this and you can either just really, really slowly retrieve it or fish it like a jig and let it come to the bottom and just fish it like that and you can drag it pop it but this hula grub this is like this is a sleeper bait this thing's caught so many fish you're going to take that little kitech round ball you're going to come in on this this fun, funky side right here the hook's going to go right in the middle of that just like a texas rig bait we're going to feed the hook up the bait that right there is a fish catching machine. And it does it, look like it has a hula skirt. That's brilliant. It does. I love it. Yes. And so that's how I like to rig that bait with that little jig head. And when a lot of times when it falls, fish will hit it. I mean, on Lake Powell, one of the guys that uh, was fishing the tournament caught all, all of his fish on this out there. And uh, it was, it's, it's a very good little bait. And I fish that a lot of times in the bites really tough. Um, it's one of my favorite ways to get bit, but another little finesse deal i'm sure has anybody heard of it i'm sure people heard of the ned rig ned rig is a, a really popular um technique again multi-species i've caught ev- anything from i caught a musky on a ned rig a big musky on a ned rig and this is a tiny tiny little bait but it's essentially it's essentially like i think i've got some i don't throw them a ton because um it's basically this is a shaky head but it's basically this style head right here, but a much shorter, smaller hook. And then you can put tiny little creature bait trailers on it. This is the Berkeley uh, little trooper. It's my favorite little creature bait. I've actually got it on one of my favorite finesse jigs. Um, This is an awesome little bait too. I throw this on a spinning rod. So those are some of my favorite little baits. And another one, if you want to fish something a little faster, it would be like a, a really finesse small jerk bait. Um, Rapala makes one. It's called the, uh, this, it's like the slash bait. It's a little Rapala slash bait and it's about three inches long. So yeah, if you all write that down, that it, it, it'll go about a foot and a half to two feet deep and you're just working it like a jerk bait. You're jerk, 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 pause, jerk, 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 pause. That catches a ton of fish too. Um, clear water bait, good clear water bait. And so for jigs, I know I, I often hear the word jig often. And is that, so with the jigs, are you always putting them at the bottom and letting them hit the bottom and then bring them up and hit the bottom and bring them up? For the most part, yes. Now, jig covers a 
very broad array of baits. There are several different types of jigs, um, but really what that is, just a just a, a jig, right? You've got some sort of a, a head. This is a football jig, so it's got this round kind of football head on it, but you've got like a, uh, hmm, this is just a little finesse jig, so it's got just a smaller kind of tapered head on it with a big weed guard right here to help bring through cover. And yeah, night, a lot of times you're fishing it like a jig. You're going to let it come to the bottom. You can either drag it, which is not hopping at all, but you just kind of pull your rod. And the biggest thing is maintaining contact with the bottom a lot of times. So you're pulling your rod or you can pop, pop, let it fall, pop, pop, let it fall. But always keep in mind, you want to try different things and let the fish tell you what they want. Um, there was a time I was fishing a chatterbait. And like I said, a lot of times, you know, this is a moving bait, but I, I remember I was doing, I casted it out and let it fall and I got hungry. So I went to like reach and grab something. I'm sitting there eating a sandwich and my line's moving. And I was like, what in the world set the hook? And it was like a four pound bass. And I was like, that was crazy. So I cast it back out again, reeled it, nothing cast back out, reel it, nothing, cast back out, reel it, nothing. And it was on a retaining wall I was fishing. So I cast it back out and I let it sit there and let it sit there. And then my line started moving. And I was like, what in the world? So, I mean, it was the weirdest thing ever, but I always like to say, you know, we can, we, the, us professionals, we like to tell people what works really, really well or what should work or like the bass fishing one-on-one, but bass can defy that if they want to. I mean, they, they really can. And sometimes they act ways that you just don't expect them to. So I always like to say, try different things. Keep a, keep a very open mind out there. And the more time you spend on the water, just experimenting and, and figuring things out and trying different combos, fishing different styles, fishing different ways, you're going to kind of understand and the fish are going to tell you what they want and how they want it. And then it'll all start to click. And it's really cool when that happens. That's awesome. I, um, I think maybe a lot of people feel this way. Y'all could tell me if I'm wrong, but I'm out of my kayak and we can get to, to kayaking here in a minute. And I, I'm looking at this huge body of water. And I know you said about shallow water, but when you look around and you don't have a fish finder on your kayak or your boat or whatever, where do you pick a spot? So what I like to do if I'm fishing um, like, a, like out offshore, on a big body of water without a depth finder. And I, I, when I first started, I did that quite a bit. The best thing you can do um, is you can get Navionics on your phone or you can look at it online. Uh, it's an app. I think it's like $10 for the entire year. And I'll actually pull it up so you guys can see it, what it looks like. Let's see here. So I have like, I have a fishing section here with all these things on my app. And the Navionics one is uh, this one right there. Okay. So what that does, it's going to show you, and I'll actually just pull up so you guys can see real quick. So yeah, here's the last, like I was looking at, this was the last term I fished. So you can see, I'm going to try to like zoom in and I can't really see what I'm doing, but it's going to show you the contours. So you come out here. Oh, there's a big river channel that runs, splits the lake, right? So you can see the channel, all shallow water islands. Um, I can look down here and say, okay, well, what's this right here? Okay, there's a hump right there, real shallow hump. So you can look at that and it'll, it'll obviously tell you where you are. So, you know, it'll give you your location on this map as you're looking at it. So I can pull this up and I can say, okay, there's a uh, old Creek channel right there. There's a road bed. I'm going to go check that road bed. And then all you got to do is if I'm, if I'm trying to feel a road bed, which is obviously hard bottom, um, cause it's an old road, I'll take a really heavy jig and I'll look at it and I'll say, okay, I think I'm right on it right now. And I'll just cast out and let that jig at the bottom and I'll just, you can feel hard bottom versus real squishy kind of soft bottom. So having just Navionics, it'll just tell you what's going on. Um, it'll give you an idea of what's going on under the water without having a depth finder. And then you can use your baits to help you understand what's going on. So a lot of times, like I'm going to try to, I'll try to find a point here so I can, okay. So like right here, well, that's not a very good point, actually. That's a very subtle point. Um, a lot of times, main leg points are going to have, um, kind of have a little bit of a harder bottom on them too. Okay. So like right here. Um, so you got this, you've got this point, right. That comes way out. So I would put my boat out here and start casting up. Cause you don't want to get on top of the point, blow any fish out, but I'd stay off deep and start casting. And as soon as I start feeling kind of that harder bottom, 
I just assumed that was probably the point, but I love using that Navi Onyx app. If I, you know, and I'm in situations like that because yeah, it, you're going to feel lost out there if you have no idea what's going on, because there are roadbeds, old creek channels. You could be casting in a hundred foot of water at nothing and not have any idea, but with that app and most lakes are on there, most all lakes are on there, which is really cool. So, That's awesome. I had no idea about that app. That is so cool. Yeah, it, it's come in handy and it saved me. And I even, I have electronics. I still look at that because it's just nice to have kind of that reference as well. Yeah. Um, Christine, let's talk about kayaks. So what would you say is a great kayak for somebody to start, you know, kayaking on, on, on bodies of water? Um, what about paddles? Like I know paddle length for your body size is a pretty important about for paddling um, safety. Yeah. Oh my gosh. There's a lot, there's a lot with that. So when it comes to kayaks, I, I tell everybody the same things. I, I started fishing in a sit on top use fishing kayak. Um, I did that for a couple of years and I paddled that when you're fishing, I've really come to love having a pedal kayak, something that you can move with your feet so that you can fish hands-free. And I can't tell you how much more enjoyable kayak fishing is having the ability to fish hands-free. And even on the real, a lot of people have this idea that you have to have these paddle kayaks on rivers, having the pedal drive kayak on rivers is a huge advantage. You're going to be making way more cash. You're going to be more comfortable. And what I tell people is when you get into kayak fishing, just like anything else, if you don't enjoy it, you're never going to do it again. So when I first got into it, um, I had the option to buy like a $150, um, kind of box sit inside kayak. And I was like, man, I, I don't, I, I was told by someone older than me that had done it for a while, wait, save a little money until you get something that you can, that you're going to actually like. And I bought my used, I was a Jackson Cusa. It's been like seven or eight years now. I think it was a Jackson Cusa and it was $700, which was a lot for me. Um, back then I was working my tail off to make that. But so I saved my money and I bought a $700 kayak and I loved that kayak. I loved it. And it was so much more enjoyable. It was comfortable. I could paddle it well. It tracked well. I wasn't getting blown all over the place. It was safer. Um, and now I'm in a Hobie, which is what, what people refer to as kind of like the Cadillac of all kayak fishing and they're expensive. I mean, they range anywhere. They, their lowest model, I think is like $1,500 and they go all the way up to six grand. So yes. Right. It's like the, it's like the price of a little John boat now, but, um, kayaks come in all different shapes, sizes, and prices. The best advice I can give you. I love Hobie. I've been with, I've been in a Hobie for five years now. And I, I, I think they make one of the best kayaks out there. Um, I love their drive system. But what I always tell people is that the, the best thing you can do is find a dealer in your area or find people that have your kayaks and demo them. Get several different brands, get several different styles, get a paddle kayak, get a pedal kayak, get on a body of water. I know in the Southeast, we've got a ton of dealers that allow you to take kayaks out and do demos. Um, and get out in the water because that's how you're going to really find out what you like and what's comfortable for you and your fishing style. More importantly, I love um, having a pedal drive kayak because when I am hands-free, um, I'm, I'm literally casting and I'm moving my kayak and I'm able to cast and move and cast and move. And it's very seamless for me. So um, yeah, I, I always recommend when it comes to kayak fishing, get something that you're going to be able to, um, enjoy and be comfortable. The seat, you know, I sit in a kayak 10 hours a day. So having a good seat for me was huge. Another thing to consider is the weight of a kayak. Um, I had my kayak weighs uh, like 160 pounds. And for a couple of years, I was loading that into the bed of my truck by myself. And it was awful. I did it. I did it, but my back, I'm like sitting like this now because my back's probably wrecked from doing that for so many years. So I have a trailer now. So I treat my kayak like a little mini bass boat. Um, so look for kayaks that, you know, you're going to be able to manage. If you have a SUV or a car, you have to car top it. You're going to want to get a kayak that you're going to be able to comfortably load and unload. Because if you're the biggest thing I've noticed with the, uh, my women's event is that ladies would buy a kayak, you know, they'd buy like a Hobie pro angler or something heavier and they, it was so hard for them to load them that they never went out fishing because they were dreading that process. So get something that you're able to do. If you've got an old jet ski trailer or an old or a trailer, 
um, and you have already have the means to get a trailer and you can just treat it like a bass boat, back it down and pull it back up, then get the nice big heavy kayak. But if you don't get an inflatable kayak, I've got an inflatable that I love to fish on. Absolutely love to fish on that has a pedal drive on it. They make really cool inflatables now too. So always consider what you're able to manage and what's comfortable and what you can spend all day in. Because at the end of the day, it has to be enjoyable or you're not going to love it. And I don't know anybody out there that hasn't gotten to the right kayak that doesn't love kayak fishing. It takes you to the most beautiful places. I've done some just amazing river floats on areas that I swear I've never seen a person because they're in the middle of a bunch of private land and you can't access them. You can't get a boat on them, but you can take a kayak and put it in this public launch and drift down. 10, 15 miles and fish. And it's created some of the most amazing memories for me. I've caught some beautiful fish from musky to a sailfish to a big sturgeon to bass to everything in between I've caught from the kayak. And I, I love it. There's a reason I'm not in a bass boat yet because I love kayak fishing so much. Well, let me tell you about the whole like weight thing of the kayak, how true that is. So I have yes. a big old, and um, I have a Jackson Mayfly. And that thing is only 90 pounds, but to get it on top of my truck by myself, who Lord have mercy, that is tough. And it's, um, and I scratched the top of my truck uh, many a times trying to get that thing up there. So that, that, if I had to go back, I would say that is a really important, uh, is. important information there for sure. Cause it's, it's not fun trying to get those heavy things on top of big trucks or, or cars. Um, what about safety or, and Safety, what kind of, is there a particular life vest that is best used for kayak fishing? Um, what kind of gear do you use or take with you when you kayak fish? Yeah, absolutely. So yes, P and I will say PFDs, a lot of people don't like to wear them, but for those of you, you ladies on, uh, on social media or uh, fishing tournaments, um, I know that all of my sponsors or any of the brands in the kayak world, if you have a really awesome picture and with a big fish on a kayak and you're not wearing a PFD, they're not going to share it. And they're going to actually, um, I learned that the hard way years and years ago. Cause I was like, I don't need my PFD. I'm fishing in a foot and a half of water. Wearing your PFD on a kayak at all times is huge. Um, it's mandatory in all of our tournaments. None of the brands in the industry that affiliate with kayak fishing will even share your stuff or even, um, acknowledge your photos or what you're doing. If you're not wearing a PFD in them, um, they won't publish it in magazines. They won't use it for anything. So PFDs, I, I mean, I, I really hammer this into people. They, they do save lives every single year at the lakes that I go to people drown kayak fishing people that are the best swimmers out there, whether they just stay a boat comes by, throws a wake, they get knocked out. They're down. I mean, freak accidents happen. Um, so as far as PFDs, I, I, I don't, I'm, I don't like being constrained in any type of way. I don't wear any jewelry. I can't stand stuff on me like that. Um, I'm, I'm just weird like that. So for me having a PFD that was super lightweight, I mean, I want to feel like I'm not wearing one. That was my goal. Um, I view, I do the blue storm inflatable PFD. Uh, they auto inflate. So if you fall in, they make an, a manual, they make an inflatable that has a pocket on it, which is great for kayak anglers. Cause you can put your cell phone in there and keep it on person. Um, I've actually got a code with them too. It's just my last name, which is Fisher 10. I think it saves like, it'll save you like 20 or 30 bucks on them, but it's bluestormgear.com. They're my favorite. I love them. Um, they make a, there's a lot of different inflatables out there. If you're not into the inflatable thing, and I just like the inflatables because like I said, it feels like you're not wearing one. They're super lightweight. They're comfortable. That's, I've tried several different brands. That's by far my favorite. I have the uh, Stratus 35. That's my, that's my favorite model, but they also do like the, uh, the, like the NRS um, or Stolquist, like the, the foam life jackets. And those are great too. They have a lot of pockets on them, which people like. But for me, it's a little cumbersome. I just feel like it's pretty big and bulky. Um, they do make kayak specific foam ones that have a shorter back on them. But anymore, I I'm a big, big fan of the inflatables. As far as other safety things, um, I, other than just the biggest thing, I do a lot of fishing by myself and I do a lot of traveling solo. So just in, in our crazy world anymore, letting people know where you are. And uh, checking in with them, I think more than any type of equipment is is number one for me. 
Um, I also like to have a whistle on me at all times in the water in case something happens in the water, check the weather all the time. Like, I mean, especially where y'all, I'm sure you guys get big pop-up storms like out of nowhere sometimes. And those yeah. are so dangerous. So if you're planning on venturing, you know, a couple miles out, if you're, if you're feeling extra adventurous, uh, always check the weather. I mean, every couple of hours to see if anything is popping up on the radar, just to, just to have an idea of what's going on. Know before you go out that day, um, trying to get either safety stuff. I mean, kayak fishing, I've, I've only flipped one kayak in my whole life. And that was my Jackson, um, way back in the day. And that's because a, a GoPro fell in the water and I went to jerk really fast to get it out. That never ends well. But other than that, I've never flipped a kayak. I, I think it's super, super safe. Um, try to think there's anything else safety related. Somebody know. was asking about wind, if it's a big problem you need to be concerned about in a kayak. If you have the right kayak, or if you have a certain type of kayak or the right kayak, no. I mean, I fished, I musky fished on Lake St. Clair and like four to five foot rollers and like a 30 mile an hour sustained win on St. Clair. Now I wouldn't recommend that for everybody that I, I was, I'm pretty seasoned out there in big water. I fished in the ocean before. Um, if you have a, what they call like a, um, like a shallow hole or a smaller kayak, I would probably be pretty aware of the wind. The nice thing about wind though, if you're, if you have a wind that's coming from the South fish, the South bank, and a lot of times you're protected. If you have a wind that's coming from the north, you know, fish the, the north bank, whatever direction the wind's coming from, fish that bank. And a lot of times you can find little pockets or little creeks or cuts that are protected by it. But yes, if it's if it's a if it's a really, really big wind, know your know your comfort level and your abilities. And the biggest thing, um, like I said, we had one day in Sweden where the waves are so big, you'd go up and come down and you couldn't see if there was a person 10 feet from you, you couldn't see them. I mean, that that was a little scary. And the biggest thing is you want to make sure that. When you, if you get caught in those situations where you have these giant waves, you need to make sure that you're not ever um, parallel with them. And, or if you're, if you're going with them, that's when you need to be very, very careful. Cause if you're coming down on a wave and it's coming with you and pushing you, I always like to kind of go catty corner into the waves. If that makes sense. Going into them is safer than going with them back in, if that makes sense. Um, you never want to be totally parallel with them. You always want to be at a little bit of an angle. As long as you're going into these giant rollers at an angle, I've always felt pretty safe out there, but definitely, um, new kayakers. Yeah. If it's pretty choppy out there, you see a bunch of big white caps, find a, find a protected little pocket for sure. That's excellent. And well, and wind here is such a, a factor. We could have some pretty gnarly winds. And man, as soon as that wind picks up, I'm just, I think I'm done for the day. I just can't, yeah. it's hard for me to cast. It's hard for me to do anything. Yes. Um, I did want to ask, what would your advice be, you know, for somebody that wants to get into maybe just kayaking at first and they're a little intimidated, how, what, what kind of advice would you give to that person about just getting in the water and getting started? The best thing you can do. Um, and that, that's the thing that I, I just, it breaks my heart to hear it because I hear it a lot in uh, women's fishing and women's event is uh, the intimidation thing. And I think it stops so many of us from really realizing our passions and what we love and what we can do and our abilities. And if you're intimidated, I totally get that. It's a, it can be a very, it can be a big thing. It can be kind of a scary thing, but the best thing you can do is just find that courage and if nothing else, find somebody in the community. I mean, I know there's uh, every state I know of has at least a, a one local trail, a kayak fishing trail, um, whether that be on Facebook pages uh, or just Googling kayak clubs in your area, reach out to that club. I've never, out of anything I've done, I've done archery, I've done hunting, I've done all these different types of hobbies throughout my life. Kayak fishing has been so incredibly welcoming all over the country. Everybody, it's like everyone's cut from the same cloth. The, the camaraderie is phenomenal. Reach out to the local clubs, guys, gals, whoever's in it, and just say, hey, I want to try this. This is something that I've been thinking about. You know, is there somebody that could help me? And I think you'd be overwhelmed at the response you would get. People just offering their kayaks, offering to take you out, offering to, to you know, teach you what they know. Because I know that, from my experience and everybody, oh, from my experience, it, I was, it was just, 
like a huge family and everyone was so willing to help and get me out in different kayaks or take me different places. And that's the same guy, gal, doesn't matter if you want to kayak fish, everyone's so eager to help you. So um, reach out on those Facebook pages or, you know, find your local club. I know New Mexico has, I think a couple of them at least uh, kayak fishing clubs. And that's what, that's where I would start. We actually did have a question that came up literally about that is, you know, um, I think it's Jeannie is wanting to know how to hook up with any local fishing groups to get out and, and, and get out there. And that's what we're trying to also establish with this particular platform is everybody that's on this, this platform with these conversations. I mean, start connecting. I mean, obviously everybody here is, is like-minded and wants to get out there. And then um, I think Matt, if, if you're able to answer maybe some of those questions, if since you're um, a kayak dealer, um, if you know of any um, local groups that uh, are out there that these folks can get on board and or start looking up on social media, that would be very helpful. Yeah, Matt went to spoon with me. Matt's a, he's a great dude. How's it going, Ramey? And I saw you put a couple of the clubs out there. And that's just another example of some awesome person in the kayak fishing community that's really eager to help and just get people into the sport because that's what we, that's what we like to do. That's excellent information. Yeah, we're getting a lot of questions here about the groups and and I didn't even know about any of the groups out here. So, I mean, I know I'll be reaching out to some of them to get some tips and tricks for, for the places out here. And I mean, for New Mexico and some of the lakes we have, I just want um, to see you guys in on some of the lakes that might be um, available to you to get out on. Um, you have Elephant Butte, maybe not on the weekends, especially if you're you're new, that would get kind of kind of busy. And when I've been out, it's been during the week and it's pretty calm. And um, Conscious Lake, Navajo, Ute Lake, Clayton, Caballo. I think Caballo would be excellent. And I I hear their bass fishing there is is pretty awesome. And I I look forward to getting out there this summer. Um, it's I like that area and it's a pretty cool lake. So I'm going to head on out that way. Um, I'm looking at some comments here, but yeah, what, I mean, is there any other bass tips that you cast that you think that maybe we should work on um, kayak, anything? Boy, I'm trying to think, you know, um, the biggest lesson or the biggest tip I can give you on casting. Uh, I always say this and I joke with the guys about it when I'm fishing a tournament and I come into a cove and I see somebody fishing the bank ahead of me, I'll watch them cast. And I'll know right then if I feel, if I'm like, oh, okay, I can, I'll fish right behind that person. Cause I'll know I'll catch a bunch of fish that they miss. Or if I see them make a certain cast, I'm like, okay, yep. I definitely am not fishing behind that person. Casting is everything. But with that being said, be patient with yourself and understand that it takes a lot of practice to get to cast better. And I'm not necessarily meaning accuracy. I'm meaning um, when you think about a bass and what the bass is feeding on, how many times does a bait do this? Like hardly ever, right? Like never. Bait's not just fall. A bass would be in heaven if bait's just falling from the sky, like kerplop, kerplop, kerplop. So that's the biggest thing I notice fishing or our tournaments is if I see somebody just cast and the bait just goes and splashes really hard in the water and they're just kind of like, and it's making a bunch of noise. I have no problem fishing behind that person and I'll catch fish behind them because learning how to cast, um, quietly and stealthily. I do a lot of skip casting. So the bait kind of just, you know, like across the water makes this really cool, like skip. Um, that's how bass are used to keying in on and tracking and, and feeding and it doesn't spook them. Uh, the cool thing about kayak fishing is that we're able to get into these super shallow, really quiet areas without spooking bass or as people on a trolling motor or a bass boat aren't going to be able to catch those fish like that, right? So if we're on a kayak and we've got this stealth approach, it's really important to, to make good casts, good, quiet, um, you know, have your mechanics down with your casting. And that's what a lot of times it'll tell people if, uh, the, like, say, say you're fishing and you've got a tree right here and here's the, here's the bank. So instead of just casting, if, if you can't cat, if you can't make a skip cast and land it real quiet up against the tree, cast like 10 feet past the tree and then bring it 
to the tree. So you're not landing because like you're fishing a shallow tree at the water's right here. Here's the bottom. And there's a fish sitting right here. If you land that bait hard right there, that fish is gone almost every single time. But if you are able to cast past the tree and then bring your bait naturally to it. So I always tell people, you can't skip because skipping, it takes a lot of practice. If you can't do that, cast past your target. Or if you've got like a sand bank or a bank that doesn't have a ton of snags on it, or even if it's grass and you've got like a weedless bait, cast on the bank and then slowly try to bring that bait just quietly into the water. That tip right there will get you way more bites is how you're casting. Very cool. I think at this point, let's open uh, some questions up for, I mean, yeah, everybody. Bring, bring the question. Yeah. Start raising your hands. I mean, Christine's a phenomenal resource here and she's just a wonderful person and she's here for y'all and to answer your questions. Yes. Here's Kira's got a question. Um, she said, have you, have you fished Ivy? How many times have you been pulled off your kayak by a fish? <laughs> <laughs> so yes, I have a, a OH Ivy is a big bass factory of the, of the country. Now I have kayak fished it, uh, I think three times now the biggest, I caught a, I think I caught a seven pounder out there was the biggest. So I haven't got into those giant, like double digits yet out there. But um, super cool, like very kayak friendly because of all the flooded salt cedar and kayaks can kind of weave and maneuver through them. So yeah, Ivy is a phenomenal kayak fishing lake. It's beautiful. It's super remote. Um, I really like it. Uh, I'm actually, I, I'm friends with Josh Jones who guides out there and puts all those big bass out there. So I, I've been watching all this stuff and I'm like, I got to get out there with uh, my electronics and, and do some do some scoping for those big fish. And as far as about pulled off, I've been pulled around. I've never been pulled physically off my kayak. Thank good. We'll knock on wood. I'm going to do that right now. But <laughs> I have been, I I got pulled, I think four miles up the coast by my sailfish I caught in the kayak. Um, this, I caught an uh, almost an eight foot sturgeon in Oregon that, I mean, I, I could, I just was holding on and just going all over the place. I've had some big musky pull me around just a little bit too. Um, uh, those are probably the fish that I, I can remember that really kind of gave me a run. Uh, I did also catch a, a pretty good sized snook down in the Everglades on my kayak that pulled the kayak a little bit too, which was cool. Oh, that's crazy. You're just along for the ride at that point. <laughs> oh yeah. I mean the, the, the sailfish, I mean, I, uh, they were literally pulled me four miles all the way oh up uh, several hundred feet deep, all the way up to about 50 feet deep. And then just up, up and down the coast. It was crazy. And uh, she was also asking about, uh, do you ever use a drop shot? What's the best bait when there's a current? Yeah, so a drop shot is an awesome, um, this the little craw I was telling you about, that's a good little drop shot bait. But if you're fishing, um, drop shot is probably one of the best baits to fish when fish are really shut down or heavily pressured. You've got clear water. It's a great smallmouth bait. And you, know, you want to use light line with that. And the drop shot's good because you have your weight and then here's your line and your hooks up here. So it gets your bait up and off the bottom and you're just fishing it. Um, so yeah, drop shot, that, that's a very finesse um, oriented technique right there. I'm not a huge finesse fisherman. I can do it. I don't prefer to. I like fishing fast and fishing big baits, but that is something that I've caught a lot of huge fish on. I've caught a lot of big smallmouth on. It's an excellent, excellent smallmouth. Uh, presentation and big largemouth as well. Um, and as far as when there's current, when there's current, boy, there's a lot. I love a spinner bait and current. I love a chatter bait and current. Um, I love top waters like uh, those uh, Chapo, um, like the crop style top water baits and current. I like fishing if you've got like with current, the biggest thing I like to find um, that's going to make you successful is if you understand how to read current. I'm sure my trout anglers know exactly what I'm talking about here is learning how to read current and how certain fish are going to utilize that current to set up and feed. You know, largemouth, they don't want to be in the fast moving current. They want to be on the eddies and um, the slack water in areas that you know, they don't want to work very hard. So they're going to sit off the current. They're going to be faced into the current that's going right by them, but they want to let the stuff come to them. Um, a lot of times those big brown trout, I think are the same way. You know, they don't want, you don't want to sit there and waste your energy holding yourself in this fast moving current. So if you've got like a, like a rock right here, and there's a bunch of current coming on both sides of it, 
you're going to want to cast right at the center of that rock because that's where the slack water is and that's where a lot of the fish are going to be so learning how to read current and that's that's i love rivers if i could fish moving water versus still water i'm a river girl at heart that's my favorite stuff to fish so river musky is like where you're going to find me on my free time which is very rare but um yes so yeah learning how to read current is good um, but you can fish literally a variety of baits and current almost anything you really want you can fish in current like got us all caught up in the chat uh steph you're on mute sorry about that i was like <laughs> Is there anybody that wants to raise their hand and ask Christine a question? On anything and everything. Hey, this is Anthony. Hey, Anthony. Hey, um, we had one of the um, tournaments at Elephant Butte and everybody was having a hard time. We only had one person out of 32 that caught the limit of five. And we have another tournament coming up as Matt mentioned at, um, at Elephant Butte for the Zia. Um, what, what would your recommendations be for pre-fishing? So I'm hoping to go out there the day before, uh, what, what, are, what is your routine? And, uh, I got skunked, uh, and so uh, my confidence isn't high at that lake right now. So what would your recommendations be? I'm pulling it up right now. I just want to look at a quick map of it so I can kind of see it. Um, gosh, it looks big. Elephant View Lake State Park. Is that it? Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Oh gosh, I have striper. So I'm guessing it's probably pretty deep. Um, what I would do just, I'm just going to look at it. Let's see map. What was your water temp there when you fished your tournament? Do you remember? Yeah, it was cold. We were, uh, man, 55, I think was high. Gosh. Yeah. yeah it was cold. The, the water was coming up. Um, yeah, it was it was tough. Everybody had had a hard time. Even uh, we had a uh, boat bass tournament there too, as well. We talked to a lot of those guys. They were getting skunked. It, it was just we weren't getting any bites. So it sounds like it was just a, a tough. So is that lake generally pretty clear? That's what it looks like. Uh, there's areas. Uh, Matt can probably correct me if I'm wrong, but further north, um, you get into that milky, stained water. Okay. That's yeah. The, where the river comes in up there. Mm -hmm. it looks like. Yes. Yeah. So with the water coming up for y'all's tournament, did that, was the, did the water all over the lake have a little bit of color to it or was it just, um, just that Northern part? Just that Northern part. Um, but there, there was a little bit of stain in it. Yeah. So typically when the, my, my general theory, when the water is rising on lakes that fast, um, the, a lot of times that'll, that will push fish like up to the banks. A lot of times the fish will kind of follow that water moving up. So it sounds like whatever phenomenon that was. And sometimes when you have water levels fluctuating like that. It's like you put a fish in a bathtub and you pull the drain out of a bathtub. That's going to, it's going to freak the fish out, right? The water temperature is mm -hmm. dropping or rising very quickly is that creates a lot of instability for those fish. So it sounds like just the conditions were uh, unusually tough for you guys there. Just looking at a map with those water temperatures, I think what I would probably do, if I don't have a lot of confidence on the lake, my biggest thing is I'm going to cover a ton of water. Um, I'm going to take uh, moving baits, like when it's real cold like that, like 55 degrees, 50, 55 degrees, I'll take and uh, uh, take like a flat-sided crankbait. So when I say flat-sided, I like throwing a flat-sided crankbait early because let me grab this one right here if I can get it out of it's caught in one of my rod tubes, which happens all the time. Travel hooks. Okay. So when I say flat-sided crankbait, that's kind of important early on in the year. Y'all have way colder water than I've got here in Texas right now. That's crazy. My inside with all my rods sticking straight up. So when I say flat-sided crankbait, I mean, um, you see how thin that is across the top. You have like a lot of your crankbaits that have kind of that like rounder profile. This is the Fritz side. It's one of my favorite like cold water crankbaits. Um, it has a tighter wobble 
a tighter wobble is really big in those water temperatures, especially. So I'll take like a flat sided crankbait or a jerk bait or in those water temperatures, even like an Alabama rig, if you guys are able to, um, there's hook laws on those. You can do like a three or a five hook. Matt can probably tell me what it is in New Mexico, but I'll take baits like that, that really play in that cold water. And I will just cover a lot of water until I get bit. Um, three hook. Okay. Thanks Remy. Um, I'll do a lot of that. Just cover water to get bit and that lake. It looks like there's a lot of like, uh, main lake points. And I would be guessing with that water temperature right now, I would be looking to find fish kind of around those main lake points. Um, an easy way to get bit. I would take like a, like I said, a little finesse jig, uh, maybe even a drop shot. A jerk bait is a great bait that time of year and just fish it around those main lake points um, fish around the secondary point. So there's a couple of creeks, it looks like on that lake. So by secondary points, I mean like the first point that comes into one of those creeks, I'd fish around that because I'm sure the bass are pretty pre-spawn right now, or maybe looking to, um, I'm, the water's gotta be warming up. It's getting warmer every day. I would start looking at those secondary points and covering a lot of water in that area with like a flat sided crankbait with a jerk bait with an Alabama rig. Um, and then slow down a little bit. If you get bit in those areas and fish a finesse jig, fish a, an underspin is, is huge, especially in the clear water, like a little fish head underspin with a swim bait. And that's going to allow you, those are like search baits. I like throwing search baits and covering a ton of water just to, because you want to find areas that have fish first. And once you find areas that are holding fish that have a fish or two or get bit, then you can kind of try to put together that pattern and try to replicate that and find out okay, was it just this area of the lake that had it? Or was it, did I catch that fish on a, on a, on a rock pile? Did I catch it on a point? Did I catch it um, on this gravel flat? Did I catch it where the bank went from clay to sand or clay to rock? What, what are, where are these fish doing? That's what, that's kind of the, that's the biggest thing for us anglers to figure out what the fish are doing and what they're holding on to. And for me, I'm going to cover as much water as possible, see, launch at various places around the lake. If you can launch three or four times in a day. Like I'll do that sometimes just to get an idea and see the water temperatures 55 down here, but up in the river where there's a shallow muddy pocket, it's warming up to like 60 degrees and fish are starting to be a little more active up there. So cover a lot of water, take those baits and run them and see if you can't hopefully, gosh, that sounds, that sounds pretty rough. Hopefully they're a little more stable for y'all for this next tournament. Yeah. The, the last tournament was a lot better, um, at a different lake. So, um, that's good. Yeah. So that, that brought my confidence back up. So hopefully this one will, will be the yeah. same. And we'll get that Navionics and look at those, con do a lot of contour study going in, but find areas like that have long, really good looking juicy points that they always have fish around them that time of year for sure. Awesome. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Yep. A couple of last questions. Um, cause I know we're getting a little pressed for time. Christine, what are your thoughts on fishing line? And then I'm, I really want to know about this. When is your women's seminar and uh, this year and is it at four? Yes, absolutely. So fishing line. Oh gosh, that's a, that's a, well, I, I love fishing line. There's three main types, right? You've got your braided line or your super lines. You've got floral carbon and you've got monofilament. All three are very, very different. They've got their own characteristics and they've got their place and time. Um, I like to say, you know, a, a good line just to kind of start with is uh, a lot of people fish monofilament. It's got a, a lot of stretch in it. Monofilament floats. So monofilament makes for great um, top water and clear water because, you know, monofilament is clear. Braid's not. Braid's the one line that's less clear than anything else. Um, but the basic thing to remember about the lines is just know a little bit about what they're good for and their characteristics. So I'll keep that pretty basic. You have two lines that are going to float braided line floats and monofilament floats fluorocarbon line sinks. So fluorocarbon, that's why guys that are fishing baits, they want to get down crank baits, moving baits, fluorocarbon is awesome for that. Um, braid, a big plus is it's very abrasion resistant right? Braid is super strong. It's rugged. It's, it's going to cut through things. So if you're fishing around, um, heavy reeds, heavy pads, um, something, you know, or you're punching, you're fishing through vegetation, heavy wood, you're going to want to be fishing braid at all times, or you're going to get your heart broke. Um, monofilament again, is really good in those 
situations where I know that a lot of walleye people fish mono because it has a lot of stretch to it. So it's good for those situations where you want the fish to be able to take your bait and, and just have a little bit extra play in that line, a little extra stretch. Um, I can get super techie with all of that, but that's, that's kind of the main stuff to remember about the, about the, the lines. Um, I run, most of my stuff is either straight fluorocarbon, um, or straight braid with a fluorocarbon leader. I will very rarely use mono. Sometimes I'll use like a monofilament leader. Again, if I want to fish like a, like a finesse top water and I need a mono leader that will keep the top water up on the water. But other than that, um, it's usually straight fluoro or straight braid. And as far as the women's event, yes. So we are, oh gosh, uh, I think this year I'm going to pull my calendar here. I'm a paper calendar person. I, I don't do the calendars on the phone. Um, I wish I probably should, but I want to get the right date. It is September. So we, um, if you go to our Facebook event page, we have, uh, it's women's fishing federation.com. I think so. I've seen someone be really good about dropping links over there. So, um, it's WWF. We have a website. It is September. I believe it's the seventh. It's the seventh, eighth and ninth or the sixth, seventh, eighth and ninth of September, that second week of September. And as far as location, um, we, we did like fork last year. We are in, we'll know it, literally in about a week. We are supposed to have it at this private, um, this private club up in Indiana, but the, the investors that bought it, there's something going on um, that we're not really sure about. So it, there's a chance it actually might be at another big private um, series of lakes and ponds down in Texas. We will know in about a week and we're gonna announce that, but the dates are that second week of September. And uh, yeah, that's a really cool event. We right now, I think we have to, we've been having to cap it at 50 women and we've capped it pretty quick just because it's literally just myself and uh, my good friend, Amanda Brandon and our other friend, Mel Isaacs that run it and put it on. And uh, we've got a couple other gals that have volunteered to help, but if we can get a couple more people to help this year, we want to open it up and increase it um, to several more women but it's, uh, we're, we're doing the best we can with the few of us that are trying to put it on, but it's an amazing event. And, uh, yeah, it would be awesome to have some of y'all at that this year. So what is the group called again? It's a women's fishing federation. Okay. And you should be able to find it on Facebook. It's uh, we've got a Facebook page there and then, uh, uh, we have the members, um, only page and my friend, Amanda, uh, her and my Mel, we all started it. I mean, she's the, she's the website gal. She's the technical everything i'm the, the the speaker and the the teacher at the event so i wish i had a lot of the details memorized but i don't i just show up when i'm told and do what i'm told so and one last question i want to get in there is um from melody she wants to know if it's difficult to get the kite in the water she's 77 and not real strong again if you've got a if you've got a kayak that is manageable, that's lighter weight, um, like the Hobie Lynx, the Hobie I-11, those lighter, very stable kayaks. No, they, they, they are definitely manageable. I think we've got, um, we've got a couple gals in their early seventies that actually come to the women's event, um, two of them, and they, they seem to have a really, really good time with it. Uh, that's awesome. I would love to see you in a kayak. That's very, very cool. Um, if you have anyone that can help you the first couple of times, or just that would probably be something I would recommend. But again, kayaks come in all different weights, lengths, shapes, and sizes. So getting one that you're able to manage the, the inflatable, check out that Hobie iTrek 9 or the iTrek 11. They weigh like 30 pounds. Mm -hmm. And I said, I have one. I absolutely love it. It's incredibly stable. You can stand up on them and very easy to move back and forth. Plus, they come with a pedal drive. So you've got that hands free fishing. All right, Christine, the last major question. When are you coming to fish in New Mexico? We got some trophy bass waters here. I know you love, you got to get out here. Yes, I will. Okay, so I was just actually thinking of that. Of all the states I fish, I've not bass fished in New Mexico. So that's one of my goals is to fish all 50 states. And uh, I would I would be so incredibly honored to come fish in New Mexico. So I don't know. And I've got friends out there. I mean, I know a lot of y'all are out there and I'm sure you guys could help, help me teach me some things about the fisheries out there. Um, we should definitely get that set up because it's not, I mean, it's not too far. And I love that part of the country too. It's beautiful out there. 
It is beautiful out here, man. You gotta let us know. We'd love I'm to have you. That, definitely, definitely gonna do that for sure. That would be so much fun. So much fun. I need a Western road trip. That's the best direction in the country to go is West. I, I wholeheartedly believe that. I couldn't agree with you more. I'm a, I love to bird hunt and that's what I like to do in, in the, the fall time. So, but Christine, thank you so much. I really appreciate you joining us. I tell you, I was a little like when I messaged you at first, I'm going, oh, she's not going to respond. And I think everybody in the hallway at work heard me scream when you mm -hmm. responded. Oh, that's uh, so cool. Thank you so much for joining us. I, I enjoyed it. I'm sure everybody here enjoyed it. And and got so much information from you and you're so busy. So thank you for taking the time out to talk with us this evening. We sure appreciate it. Oh no, the, the, the pleasure is all mine. And again, I'm so happy. I saw that message. Sometimes I th I, they get lost and I don't see them, but I think it was divine intervention that that one popped up. And I was like, this is so cool. Of course I want to do this. So, and let me know if there's a bunch of, if there's more questions or anything that, and you guys want to do this again sometime, just please reach out. I'd love to join y'all again. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, Jennifer, you want to end us with some, some message? <laughs> I think your message was fantastic. Um, it's really hard to top Christine's information and, and your amazing personality and your willingness to, to give of your time for all of us. And yeah, I think we're going to need to host you out here in person because that was a big ask in a lot of um, our chat was when can we get together and fish? So maybe we need to start planning that for, for next spring or summer and, and just make it happen. So, but yeah, Absolutely. look forward to that. And again, thank you so much. And thank you everyone who has been on the conversation this evening. It's been an honor to have Christine and I'm sure you need to follow her so you can get additional tips and all of that awesome information and just keep following her. That's the way we learn is, is just to follow people and interact. So, but thank you all for an amazing evening. And thanks, Stephanie, so much for, for starting that conversation. This has been a fantastic uh, session. So thank you all. All right. Well, y'all have a good evening. Until next time. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Christine. Thank you guys so much.